The next important uh, wave of peoples coming in here are the Vikings. The Viking invasions begin 750 AD to about 1050 AD. And uh, they go and just, they go everywhere. And they pillage, plunder, burn, and destroy everything in their path. Uh, they made it to North America. They went up into Greenland, Iceland, just all over the place. And uh, then after the Vikings, this brings us up to the Normans. And the Normans, of course, were French. And they invaded uh, the island in 1066 under William the Conqueror. So the Normans come in then to the British uh, Isles. They conquer the place. Uh, they regard the Anglo-Saxon, the English peoples, with contempt, but they like the Celts. And uh, they invite the Celtic storytellers to come into their Nor French Norman courts and tell stories of their native heroes, from which the prototypes of the Arthurian knights are based, Gawain being based on an Irish hero, Cahulin, and uh, Mordred, and uh, uh, Tristan, and all of the, these Welsh storytellers. And in particular, there was a very famous one named Laharis, or uh, Brary, and his name varies, who would come to the French courts and tell these stories. And it is likely that uh, the, the French, who were the first to really create the Arthurian romantic ideal, may have picked it up from these Welsh Celtic uh, storytellers. So uh, that gives you a sense then, uh, I know that's a lot of information, but I just want to make the point that we have wave after wave after wave of people coming in to Britain and uh, Europe and bringing into these areas with them their own mythologies, their own mythological systems. And they begin to fuse the mythologies that they carry with them in their heads with features of the local landscapes, local native folk tales and traditions. And out of this fusion comes the grails. So the next thing, um, that's, that's the first uh, section that I want to bring out. The next thing then is, um, the symbolism of the grail itself. I just want to say a few words about that. Um, Cratium de Troyes is regarded generally as, as of course, the first uh, great Arthurian writer. And his grail story, the Percival, upon which Walfram's text is based, is generally thought to be the oldest of these texts. And where he got the Percival, no one is really sure. Uh, he claims to have got it from uh, Count Philip of Flanders, some book that he had. But that book has been lost. No one really knows where he got it. The best guess is probably from one of these Welsh uh, storytellers. And uh, then we have, but what I really want to draw your attention to and focus on for a, a moment is Robert de Boron. His text is uh, the Joseph of Arimathea. Now, the high period of the Grail Romance is, is between 1180 to 1230. So we're, we're dealing with this period here. And uh, the Joseph of Arimathea text is, is one of the oldest of the, uh, the Grail stories. And it's one of the two or three Grail stories that uh, have little to do with the Arthurian knights. So I just want to say a few words about uh, Joseph. Um, Joseph of Arimathea, you'll find in uh, the Gospels, is mentioned at the very end as this Jewish member of the Sanhedrin who uh, went to Pontius Pilate and he was a convert to the faith, the Christianity. And he went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of Christ. And uh, Pilate gives him the body. And then he, along with uh, Nicodemus and the two Marys, go and take the body and they bury it in this tomb. And that's all we hear about Joseph in the Gospels. But there are a number of apocryphal texts that elaborate the Joseph stories. And it was uh, these texts that Robert built his uh, account of the origins of the Grail story out of, and uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus being one of these, uh, being the main apocryphal text. So what Robert, uh, the story that Robert tells goes something like this. Um, Joseph is then, uh, he has also received the Grail from Pontius Pilate, with, along with the body of Christ, which is thought to be uh, the cup that Christ had for the Last Supper, so the Thursday night communion meal that everyone drank his blood from. And uh, Joseph is said to have set the cup at the foot of the bleeding Christ and to have caught drops of blood in that cup. And he takes the cup with him. And he's thrown in prison by the Jews, uh, who are uh, very suspicious of his uh, sympathies with uh, Christianity. So uh, while in prison, the Grail was said to have sustained him inexhaustibly with nourishment. And uh, 
he was said to have had a vision in which Christ appeared to him while in prison and said, you have to pack up and go here, up to the British Isles. And uh, so Joseph takes off. He's led out of prison by the emperor of Vespasian, who is converted, uh, not really converted, but becomes sympathetic to Christianity because of uh, he had leprosy and uh, the veil of Veronica touched his face or something along these lines. And it cured him of leprosy. So he lets Joseph out of prison. And uh, Joseph, in the company of his sister and his sister's husband, Bron, this will be a significant name here, Bron, set off in the company of a number of Jewish converts to Christianity on a pilgrimage north to this island called Britain. And uh, we're, we're supposed to have, we're supposed to think of echoes here of the Jews wandering in the desert after the Exodus. Things start going wrong. The crops start dying. They can't find any food. They start blaming Joseph. And they say, look, what's the problem here? Check in with, with God and see what, what do we need to do here. So Joseph goes and, uh, I don't know, maybe he goes up on a hill or something and communes with uh, Christ, who tells him to build a table. And the table is supposed to be a commemoration of the table of the Last Supper. And he is there to uh, leave the seat blank at which Judas was supposed to have sat, and use the grail, and his brother-in-law, Bron, is supposed to fish out of the water a single fish, which will miraculously feed the entire company. And so this is why Bron is termed the rich fisher. And uh, it does so, and I guess by a process of musical chairs or something, the uh, sinners are left standing and everyone's sitting down, and the people who are sitting down are are the, the chosen ones, and the sinners have to have to go. So this leaves, this whittles the company down, and uh, then there are a number of uh, the text continues. It's a rather boring text if you ever read it. It's it's extremely extremely boring. It's basically a, a series of genealogies. To, you find out who inherits the Grail and, and this whole line. But the point that I want to bring out, I want to draw your attention to this guy, Bron, the rich fisher, um, who is not. Wounded, and so far as I know, this is the only text in which a Fisher King variant appears without any kind of a wound or a castration or anything like that. In fact, Wagner, in his Parsifal opera, emphasizes the wound to such a degree that uh, you know you're ready to just uh, choke on it. So the wound of the Fisher King and Fortis, Wagner's Parsifal is based on Wolfram's uh, Parsifal, but he completely changes it, and. Uh, the, the, uh, the wound was inflicted on uh, the Fisher King and Fortis by the spear of Longinus. Uh, the evil magician Klinger comes in, takes the spear, and stabs him with it. And it's only that spear that can heal the wound. Uh, so Bron then, uh, it was Roger Loomis's thesis in his, his great book, uh, The Grail, From Celtic Myth to Arthurian Romance. It draws your attention to Bron, and he says, well, Bron is actually a transformation of a Welsh sea god named Bran, Bran the Blessed, whom we find in the Mabinogion, uh, who turns up as this semi-divine figure who is wounded through the foot, actually killed by a spear that stabs through his foot, and uh, they cut off his head, and they're supposed to bury the head in Britain, and it goes into all these other things. But um, Loomis wants to suggest that Bran the Blessed is a counterpart of the Irish sea god Menanan MacLear. Manan MacLear and Bran the Blessed, who's Welsh, both had cauldrons that uh, Bran's cauldron was said to resurrect the dead. And Manan lived this, this sort of Irish Poseidon. He lives under the sea, and the drowned sailors uh, sift down, I guess, like sediment. And uh, when they get down there, they drink from this inexhaustible cauldron of beer, I suppose, ale. And uh, it resurrects them, and they eat from the flesh of the swine that the Mananan has, and the swine renews itself every night, like the moon renews itself every month. So the swine is associated with the moon. And uh, so this becomes, in Loomis's idea, transformed into, um, by the process that I was mentioning earlier, mythogenesis, the Christian Eucharist, the, the, uh, the blood, the ale becomes the blood, and the flesh of the swine becomes the wafer that you eat. So the, the Celtic, or the Grail scholars, make this analogy. And so we get the fusion of these ideas. 